Standard as a magic format, by its very nature, changes more than your typical format. Thanks to set rotation, no singular card will stay in Standard forever, and new sets always threaten to shake up the format. While this is one of the main selling points of the Standard format, sometimes a card enters the Standard format and utterly warps the game around it. Be it for its own power in a vacuum, or how the card synergizes with cards already in the format, sometimes a card will take an entire format and make it about itself until the card finally rotates or gets banned. And starting us off at number 10, we have Collected Company. This is an instant that costs 3 generic and 1 green mana, and allows you to look at the top 6 cards of your library. Then you put up to 2 creature cards of the mana value 3 or less from those top 6 into the battlefield, and the rest of the bottom of your library in any order. This card was printed back in the Tarkir block, which saw several high-powered cards into the standard format. While the format at the time saw various competent decks such as Sidisi Whip, Collected Company was already seeing results. Green aggro decks in Standard quickly adopted the card for how it allowed someone to get ahead on mana, potentially getting 6 mana's worth of creatures for just 4 mana. Given that Collected Company is an instant, you were able to play it in response to your opponent's spells. This meant that control decks in the format were less sure when to best tap out, as tapping out would leave them vulnerable to the Temple Swing of Collected Company. These same control decks would also be forced to commit a board wipe only for someone to instantly rebuild with Collected Company. As the format progressed, even more decks built around Collected Company rose into prominence. It was after rotation where Collected Company found its true dominance, however. While the Tarkir block remained in standard, the sets such as Theros that had defined the meta before it were gone. Battle for Zendikar saw the printing of Reflector Mage, a 3 mana value creature that could be cheated out with Collected Company. Whenever Reflector Mage enters the battlefield, you return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand, and then that creature's owner cannot cast spells with the same name as that creature until your next turn. This not only could clear up problematic cards from the board, but would then actively delay the opponent from redeploying it. Hitting one or even two Reflector Mages with Collected Company was a massive tempo swing that would both advance your board, but deny your opponent the ability to rebuild. The power of this tempo swing eventually got Reflector Mage banned since blue-white-green Collected Company decks ran rampant in the format. Collected Company itself never got banned, if only because by the time of its dominance, it was already nearing the end of its time in the format. That's part of why it only lands here at number 10, because while it was certainly powerful and even got a card ban, it didn't overtake Standard quite as intensely as other cards higher in this list. And at number 9, we have Smuggler's Copter. This vehicle artifact costs 2 generic mana and has 3 power and toughness. Since it's a vehicle, it's not inherently a creature and only has access to that power and toughness after you crew it. Smuggler's Copter has a crew of 1, meaning you have to tap any number of creatures you control with a total power of 1 or more to make Smuggler's Copter a creature until end of turn. As a creature, beyond its stats, it also has the keyword ability flying, which means it cannot be blocked except by creatures with flying or reach. Whenever Smuggler's Copter attacks or blocks, you may draw a card, and if you do, discard a card. While this card does not provide direct card advantage, it provides a repeatable form of card selection. While this isn't an uncommon sort of effect for blue to get, card draw is not freely given to every color. As such, Smuggler's Copter was something of an outlier, providing card selection to decks regardless of what colors they were. This was a major part of what made Smuggler's Copter so prevalent in Kaladesh Standard. Not only was it card selection for colors that would opt to not get it, but even for colors that had other options for card draw still saw use to run Smuggler's Copter. This is in part thanks to how aggressive its stat line was, especially at the time. Most vehicles are held back by the requirement of tapping other creatures to use them, but since Smuggler's Copter could be crewed by something as simple as a 1-1 power servo token, it was easy to have Smuggler Copter consistently available for combat. Any small creature was generally better left back to crew a Smuggler's Copter, since the 3-3 flyer invalidated most any creature smaller than it. If Smuggler Copter had been a blue card, perhaps it would not have been so format-defining, but the fact that any deck could run the card meant that, in practice, every deck realistically needed to run the card. Without your own Smuggler's Copter to threaten trading, your opponent could keep attacking in and bolt sculpt their hand and whittle down your life in the process. Standard deck lists essentially began with four copies of Smuggler's Copter, which was the primary reason behind its banning. And at number 8, we have Lotus Cobra. This snake costs one generic and one green mana and has two power and one toughness. Lotus Cobra's keyword ability, Landfall, triggers whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control. Each card with Landfall has its own specific effect whenever a land enters, and in the case of Lotus Cobra, it generates one mana of any color whenever it sees a land enter. This essentially gives you one mana for each land you play before even tapping it or doing anything else with it. Playing your third land with a Lotus Cobra on board allows you to play a spell with a mana value of 4 one turn early, essentially cheating on mana. This is really just the floor of Lotus Cobra's value, however. Lotus Cobra's real strength comes when combined with the effects that play extra lands. When the card was initially printed into standard in the Zendikar set, it came alongside 5 fetch lands. Misty Rainforest was a land that could be sacrificed to search for a forest or island and put into the battlefield. While by itself this is quite potent since it allows you to fix your mana, alongside Lotus Cobra it would generate 2 landfall triggers off of your 1 land drop for the turn. 
This standard format also included the card Knight of the Reliquary, which could sacrifice a forest or plains to search a library for a land and put into the battlefield. You could sacrifice a forest to grab a fetch land to then just sacrifice the fetch land and grab another forest. And each time a land entered the battlefield, Lotus Cobra would generate one mana. And those forests you search could also be tapped for mana before being sacrificed. Once these decks had generated enough mana, they would play Sovereigns of Lost Alara, which could search out a game-ending aura spell to overwhelm your opponent before they had much of a chance to even properly set up. This deck was exceptionally fast for the time, able to turbo into Eldrazi Conscription quickly and consistently. This deck would win Grand Prix Millen in various other Lotus Cobra big mana decks with Rise of Prominence in the Zendikart standard. While Lotus Cobra was not banned in standard like most other cards on this list, it does have the notable distinction of making a second appearance in standard. Lotus Cobra was reprinted in Zendikar Rising and instantly saw success in Omnath Locus of Creation ramp decks that aimed to make as many land drops as physically possible in one turn. Both times Lotus Cobra was in standard, it saw play both in the best decks in the format, but also found its way into almost every green deck as well. The Zendikar sets that included Lotus Cobra were built around getting the most out of land drops, and coupled with other cards already in the standard format at the time, it made for perfect formats for the snake to see success. And at number 7, we have Necropotence. This enchantment costs 3 black mana and comes with a rather steep downside of skipping your draw step. It also exiles any card you discard to the graveyard, serving as a self-inflicted form of graveyard hate. That also limits your card draw. This would make most cards absolutely unplayable. But Necropotence's final ability is powerful enough to offset all of that. You can pay 1 life to exile the top card of your library face down. Then put that card into your hand at the beginning of your next end step. This is an activated ability that only costs 1 life and has no restrictions on how many times it can be activated. As long as you have life, you can keep activating Necropotence. While you'd no longer get to draw on your draw step, in exchange you could refill your hand for almost free at the end of turn. Life is a resource in Magic, so while there was some risk to using Necropotence, generally the cards provided by it allowed you to easily protect yourself. Competitive Magic's earliest days in the mid-90s were dominated by Black Necropotence theme decks. These decks made use of Dark Ritual to deploy Necropotence as early as turn 1, or play some other early game form of advantage or threat. While the options for controlling the board were far more limited at the time, this standard had access to Nevenral's disc, which could clear the board of any threats that were threatening you. These decks relied heavily on Drain Life, which costs 1 generic and 1 black mana, as well as an additional cost of X that could only be paid with black mana. Drain Life deals X damage to any target, and you gain life equal to the damage dealt. This both helped the deck close the gap in life totals, as well as allowed you to spend even more life on Necropotence. Various builds Necropotence showed up in Standard, winning Pro Tour Dallas in 1996 with a more control-oriented build. The 1997 Worlds event saw a more aggressive beatdown Necropotence deck see success in a top 8 finish. These were some of Magic's earliest competitive events, and even when it did not win, it was clear Necropotence was the deck to beat in the room. The black deck that won Worlds was not a Necropotence deck, but splashed lands that could produce various colors to tech options such as white mana to cast the Disenchant in the sideboard to deal with Necropotence and other potent artifacts and enchantments. While Disenchant is a common card even in modern sideboards to this day, for a black deck to run Disenchant as essentially its only white card singled quite heavily the prevalence of Necropotence in the format. And coming to number 6, we have Jace the Mind Sculptor. This Planeswalker costs 2 generic and 2 blue mana, and enters the battlefield with 3 loyalty counters. Its first ability adds 2 loyalty counters look at the top card of target player's library. You may then put that card on the bottom of the player's library if you so choose. Its next ability has 0 loyalty and allows you to draw 2 cards, then put two cards from your hand on top of your library in any order. And by removing one loyalty counter, you can return target creature to its owner's hand. And then his ultimate ability costs 12 loyalty and exiles all cards from target player's library, then that player shuffles their hand into the library. At the time of its printing in the World Wake, this was the first and only Planeswalker to have four loyalty abilities. When Jace entered the battlefield, he could be used to temporarily remove a threat that could pressure it. Or, if the coast was clear, could be used to sculpt your hand with its zero loyalty ability, which essentially functioned as a free brainstorm. What made Jace almost backbreaking was when its controller had the advantage that plus 2 ability could be used to check the top card of your opponent's deck. While you didn't have a great deal of control, repeated use of the plus 2 ability could deny your opponent the cards they needed to come back, or leave them stuck drawing dead cards like a lance. Eventually, enough of this gets Jace high enough loyalty to activate his ultimate ability, which essentially wins the game on the spot by leaving your opponent with little to no cards left in their deck and no cards in their hand to fight with. Jace provided a level of inevitability that most win conditions at the time just could not manage. It didn't help that this was a time where Planeswalkers were still a relatively new card type in the grand scheme of the game, and thus many of the modern answers to them were not available. All these factors led to Jace being the de facto top end threat of most every blue deck in the format. Jace's presence in Standard was so dominant that the card would end up being banned in Standard at a time when this was far from common. 
Modern Magic players may be used to frequent banlist updates for the standard format of the current day, but this was a trend that only really began around the time of Kaladesh Standard. At the time Jace was banned in Standard, it was the first standard banning in years. However, while there's no denying Jace was a menace to the format and clearly game-breaking, the standard Jace was in was notable for having two unrelated cards both absolutely breaking it at the same time. Which leads us to number 5, Stoneforge Mystic. This core artificer costs 1 generic and 1 white mana, and has 1 power and 2 toughness. When Stoneforge Mystic enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an equipment card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shovel your library. You may also pay 1 generic and 1 white mana and tap Stoneforge Mystic to put an equipment card from your hand onto the battlefield. Stoneforge Mystic could search and cheat into playing any equipment card in the game. To this day, it remains arguably the most powerful equipment support card ever printed, and is the backbone of competitive decks in various formats. It's no surprise then that when combined with the various powerful equipment from the Scars of Mirrodin block that Stoneforge Mystic took over standard. The deck leveraged various equipment options such as Sword of Feast and Famine to provide both protection to the creature and snowball advantage. The most threatening equipment in these decks, however, was always Batter Skull, a 5 mana value equipment that gives the creatures equipped to 4 power and toughness, as well as Vigilance and Lifelink. This means that not only does the equipped creature not tap to attack, whenever it deals damage, you gain life equal to that damage. Batter Skull also has a living weapon keyword, which creates a 0 power and toughness germ token that automatically equips the Batter Skull when it enters the battlefield. This, alongside Stoneforge Mystic, meant that for just 2 mana, you could drop Batter Skull and already have it on a creature ready to go. Between this and equipping Squadron Hawk with various equipments, the Cawblade deck rose to dominate the standard format. The only thing that prevented Cawblade from being the only playable deck was the overall power level of the format aligned for various strategies, including Splinter Twin to exist. Of course, many players just chose to run Stoneforge Mystic in a small equipment package in their Splinter Twin decks, or in any other strategy they were playing. Stoneforge Mystic was banned out from the format alongside Jason the Mind Sculptor for its similar format overwhelming nature. Notably, Stoneforge Mystic was still allowed in Standard if you played an unedited version of one of the time available pre-constructed Standard decks since it just so happened to come with two copies of Stoneforge Mystic. While some could argue Jace deserves to be higher than Stoneforge Mystic, Mystic was the actual build-around card of the format. Jace was a generically powerful win condition for slower decks, whereas Stoneforge Mystic was a card that built an entire playstyle around it. And at number 4, we have Oko, Thief of Crowns. This Planeswalker costs 1 generic, 1 green, and 1 blue mana, and enters the battlefield with 4 loyalty counters. You can add 2 loyalty counters to create a food token, which is an artifact token that allows you to pay 2 mana and sacrifice it to gain 3 life. His second ability adds 1 loyalty ability and makes target artifact or creature lose all abilities and become a green elk creature token, with power and toughness of 3. His final ability costs 5 loyalty and allows you to exchange control of target artifact or creature you control and target creature and opponent controls with power 3 or less. Now, while at a glance, Oko might not seem like the most backbreaking Planeswalker. A lot of his power comes from the numbers for his loyalty abilities. Oko has two abilities that gain him loyalty, which is a rarity for Planeswalkers, and is especially rare for a Planeswalker to have a removal ability that's loyalty positive. Oko can remove any creature artifact on the board and go up to 5 loyalty while doing so. This means even if you do not have a way to block the 3 power elk you've just created, your Oko should survive with 2 loyalty counters. And that 3 power elk is nothing compared to the value you would have gotten from the abilities or stats from the original permanent Oko changed. Oko also provides its user with a stream of bodies by turning his food tokens into elks to use for offense or defense. Even without his very easy to activate ultimate ability in mind, Oko was a grindy, powerful card which overtook games if not answered. Eldraine standard was remarkably high powered, but Oko was a cut above with most decks in the format playing at least blue and green to run Oko. However, it also meant when Oko was finally banned, another powerful deck took its place. Oko, in a way, was the only thing holding back Field of the Dead decks from also overtaking the format and getting banned. This is worth mentioning because some could say Field of the Dead deserves a spot on this list. However, Oko serving as a stopgap against that deck only further shows why it deserves a spot on the list instead. While other decks built around cards like Fires of Invention would rise to prominence after Oko's Wake, None of those decks had much of a chance in the peak of Oko standard. To this day, Oko remains banned in most every format, which in some ways makes his standard dominance somewhat unsurprising. But there's no denying that Oko was one of the most warping cards to have ever entered the standard format and get banned out of it. And at number 3, we have Arcbound Ravager. This artifact creature is a beast that costs 2 generic mana and has 0 power and toughness. Arcbound Ravager has the keyword ability Modular, which makes it enter the battlefield with the plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. And whenever it puts into the graveyard, you may put its plus 1 plus 1 counter into target artifact creature. Arcbound Ravager also has the ability to sacrifice an artifact to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter onto itself. Mirrodin Black Standard was defined by the powerful artifact cards included in the set. Most notable amongst the artifact synergies in the block was the keyword Affinity for artifacts, which made spells with the ability cost less based on the number of artifacts you controlled. 
This had a snowballing effect where the more cheap artifacts you cast with Affinity meant the next one would cost even less to cast, eventually getting to a point where cards like Frogmite were completely free. We could realistically make a list of the top 10 cards that broke Mirrodin standard alone since there are so many powerful cards that warp the format, such as Chromox allowing for artifact decks to get well ahead of mana turn 1 in exchange for a card in hand. The artifact land cycle was integral as well, with the Seed of Synod functioning almost exactly like an island but with the addition of being an artifact and lacking the basic land type. While all of these cards certainly contributed to the explosive power of Affinity and Standard at the time, it was Arcbound Ravager that truly pushed the strategy overboard. Arcbound Ravager made combat a nightmare to navigate, since they were very rarely any good blocks to make. This is mostly thanks to the fact that any artifact creature that gets blocked in combat is then free to be sacrificed to grow Arcbound Ravager if need be. While one might think the obvious answer is just to always block the Arcbound Ravager, the modular ability makes it so that in practice you need to block every creature. If there are enough counters on Arcbound Ravager or enough creatures on board to sacrifice, the Affinity player was able to simply sacrifice every artifact they controlled to Arcbound Ravager, then sacrifice the Arcbound Ravager itself. The ability does not specify another artifact, meaning Arcbound Ravager is free to sacrifice itself to its own ability, even if the ability will then do nothing. However, since Arcbound Ravager died, Modular then triggers and all those counters are going to be moved onto whatever creature was not blocked and suddenly deal lethal damage out of thin air. Arcbound Ravager took the already fast engine of Affinity decks and gave it a win condition that was nearly impossible to play around profitably in the format. When addressing the format with bans, Arcbound Ravager was the first card ban from the standard format alongside all five of the colored artifact lands. To this day, Arcbound Ravager remains a potent threat in modern Affinity decks despite the years of powerful artifact creatures that have come out since, and its impact on Mirrodin block standard turned it into one of the most broken standard formats of all time. However, there is one format that produced multiple cards that make even this look fair in comparison. And at number 2, we have Talarian Academy. This legendary land can be tapped to add 1 blue mana for each artifact you control. As already covered in the entry for Arcbound Ravager, Artifact decks are no stranger to playing out as many artifacts as they can to cheat on mana. Talarian Academy historically was one of the first great examples of exactly this, serving as the most powerful member of a cycle that included other powerful lands such as Gius's Cradle. While this was still early on in Magic's history, many of the most powerful cards of the time were artifacts. Mana Vault was legal and standard at the time alongside zero mana value artifacts like Mox Diamond, that would both provide mana on their own as well as allow Academy to make more mana. The goal of the deck was to cast the enchantment Mind Over Matter as quickly as possible, which with a strong opening hand was possible in the first turn of the game. Mind Over Matter allows you to discard a card to tap or untap target artifact, creature, or land. From there, you would untap your Tolarian Academy to generate as much mana as possible. You ran 4 copies of Time Spa to refill your hand and deck as well as untap even more lands and essentially drew through your deck until you had enough mana to cast the spell Stroke of Genius, which draws target player cards equal to the amount of mana paid for X and its mana costs. The goal was to make your opponent to draw more cards than they actually had in their deck to make them lose the game on the spot. Magic the Gathering has never seen a combo quite on this level before, and to this day, a turn 1 or 2 kill is seen as as good as it gets for a combo deck. While a consistent turn 2 kill is strong by today's standards, at the time this was absolutely backbreaking, leading to a period of time which would go on to be known as Combo Winter. Games were decided essentially with the beginning die roll and led to standard banning Boltelarian Academy alongside one of its best ways to refill the hand in Windfall. It's safe to say that Telerian Academy is the strongest standard deck to have ever fully existed. The impact of Combo Winter on the game vastly impacted card design moving forward and genuinely threatened Magic's stability as a game. While Telerian Academy was a bulk of the pain players felt in the actual gameplay, there was another card from the same block not banned in the same initial wave that cast perhaps an even larger shadow over the standard format. And at number 1, we have Memory Jar. This artifact costs 5 generic mana and can be tapped and sacrificed to have each player exile all cards from their hand face down and draw 7 cards. At the beginning of the next end step, each player discards their hand and returns to their hand each card they exile this way. Memory Jar is from Urza's Legacy, the same block as Talarian Academy. As such, the same vast mana production was still at play with plenty of artifacts able to get Memory Jar as soon as possible. All one would have to do is get 3 mana to cast Tinker to search Memory Jar from their deck. From there, Memory Jar at the surface seems similar to a strange riff of Wheel of Fortune effects where instead of discarding your original hand, you exile it and get it back later in exchange for a new hand you're only allowed to use for just this turn. But in practice, this meant the player could empty their original hand, then activate Memory Jar and completely refill their hand. From there, you'd cast more mana and draw spells and find some way to replay Memory Jar. Yagmoth's Wheel would eventually allow you to cast Memory Jars from the graveyard, and without much effort, you can go through the entire deck. The goal is to find a copy of the enchantment, Megrim, which deals 2 damage to the opponent whenever they discard a card. 
Then, at the end of turn, all those memory jars will trigger, discarding their current hand and returning the most recently exiled cards back to the hand. Each time this happens, there will be a full 7 cards discarded, which will all trigger Megrim to deal a load of damage and most likely kill your opponent. The deck was just as fast as the Tolarian Academy deck, although it never truly got to see its true time to dominate standard. Urza's Legacy released in the February of 1999, a couple of months after the banlist that removed Academy from the format. At the start of March, they banned a few more cards, such as Lotus Petal, to further hamper any combo decks. Then they realized just how broken Memory Jar was and did an emergency banlist update in the middle of March just to make sure Memory Jar decks did not extend Combo Winter any further. Memory Jar remains the only card ever emergency banned out of a standard and the fastest sanctioned competitive format banning of any card ever. While Memory Jar did not ever get a takeover competitive standard environment, that's simply because it broke standard before it ever even got a chance to. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any cards you think we may have missed, or have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, please let us know down in the comments below.